Hi there, I'm Martin Pusick. I have the honor of being the Brigham Educational Institute's Medical Education Scholar in Residence. And um, today I'd like to present the third in our series on the Master Adaptive Learner. Um, this one's entitled The Assessing and Adjusting Phases. And what we'll do today is we'll briefly review what the Master Adaptive Learner model is all about. And we're going to concentrate on the phases uh, called the assessing and adjusting phases that, um, that comprise the end of a Master Adaptive Learner cycle. To start our review, this is all content that got developed at the American Medical Association as part of a special interest group that was focused on lifelong learning. And uh, that group comprised initially of 11 schools and then, and then from representation from even more across the American Medical Association's consortium, struggled with what it was to be a lifelong learner and, um, and came up with this cycle called the Master Adaptive Learner. And, um, and in this conceptualization, what um, was the point we're trying to make is, is that um, learning is a core part of the identity of a clinician moving forward. And so that it's not a nice to have, it's now a need to have. And, uh, and the three main components embodied by the three words in the moniker are that you, first and foremost, that you have to be a learner. And that, as I, as I said, is part of the core identity. And uh, learning is in service of a higher level of expertise, uh, an expertise that can balance routine approaches with being able to learn what I'm doing. And then the third part, uh, as embodied by the word master, is that, um, is that uh, it's not enough to want to be a learner, you need to be good at it. And, um, and mastering core concepts of learning is what we're trying to do with the model. And, and we're trying to create a shared vocabulary around learning and what the evidence base is for the way we learn not just as humans, but as clinicians. And the claim is that, um, that clinicians need to learn in a, in a specific way. So, um, so this is uh, the Dreyfus and Dreyfus model of expertise development. And we've gone through this each time, but to, to reiterate uh, where, what we're aiming for is not just being an automatic expert, as, as difficult as that already is, but to become an adaptive expert. So whatever the health system throws at us in, in the coming years, we can, we can adapt to those changes and not only adapt in terms of becoming a, a new kind of automatic expert, but to adapt in order to thrive on the change and to exploit the opportunities that it brings. So, um, so this is the master adaptive learner cycle. It, it's modeled on the PDSA cycle for those of you familiar with the quality improvement world. And, um, and starting in the top right, um, we plan uh, what, to, what we're going to learn and that requires us to, to recognize um, a gap in our, uh, in our ability and our knowledge. And uh, recognizing that we move on to learning and, um, and learn that material that's what went over in session two. And then, um, and then having learned, what we're going to concentrate on today is we need to assess the place of that learning. Were we successful in learning? And with this successful learning, what shall we do with it? And how, how, um, how will we move forward? And that fourth, uh, fourth wheel up in the top left called adjusting means that having learned something successfully, um, how am I going to change the world? And the world might be my narrow microsystem or it might be my organization or it might be um, interacting nationally. So that, um, but what, it, what I really like about the model is that it explicitly says that it's not just about me learning by myself, but rather that that tree can't just fall in the forest. Um, we need to, need to get out there and use that learning and vote with it to make, uh, make our health systems better. 
And so the last time we went through learning and how to learn it, and, and we made some, some points about, uh, about learning that it's, um, and, and specifically the, some non-intuitive points that learning is not linear, that some of the best learning is difficult and doesn't feel great. And that learning is more about later and less about now. And so we need to learn for the long run, which is not straightforward. And finally, we made the point that learning is not necessarily about the individual and is more about um, uh, moving that individual so that they fit well and adapt well with a difficult context that is the health professions. And, um, and we finished with a slide describing how, uh, how adaptive expertise is different from traditional learning. And I won't go through every element of this, but, the, uh, but important to our discussion today is that we, we focus on adapting the learner to the environment as opposed to what we often think of as teaching, which is to adapt the environment to the learner. And this requires the learner to step out of their comfort zone and, um, and you know, look at the, at the fit between themselves and the situation. And this requires from us as teachers a uh, coaching mindset. You know, sort of the idea that we're going to supply our learners with tools that allow them to become adaptive and allow them to enact adaptive expertise. <clears throat> and so that's embodied in this graphic in which um, on the left, we start off when we're just learning a skill or learning to be clinicians, the, um, the, the teacher adapts the learning to the learner. And so we put training wheels on the bicycle in order to allow you to get started. So that um, so we adapt the learning to the uh, to the learner, but as we move forward and as the learner develops, then we have to pivot. And we have to pivot to adapting the learner to the thing to be learned. So that that's when we put them in clinical environments and support them and coach them as they develop and interact with what can be um, difficult uh, difficult experiences and difficult uh, things to carry out. And so, uh, so the model in its entirety has this planning, learning, assessing, and adjusting rhythm. And, um, and let's focus now on the planning and assessing parts of the, of the cycle. And so planning, uh, we, we talked about it a little bit last time, but, uh, but we're going to focus more on it because in, in, in engendering a learner who has adaptive expertise, what we want them to do is to accurately assess when they're not good enough, when, they're, when they need to learn and what they need to learn. And, uh, and that, you know, in the early stages, we specify educational objectives. You show up to class, we give you a first slide that, uh, that says what we're going to learn today. The world ain't like that. And so that um, so it can be hidden what, uh, what you need to be learning. And so that's what we're going to explore today. And a key part of um, figuring that out is informed self-assessment, that assessing part in the bottom left there. And so that the interaction of these two cogs in this master adaptive learner um, conceptualization is really quite interesting. And, and it's non-linear as well in the sense that you have to go from planning to assessing and back to planning um, over and over again. And so, uh, so we'd like to show it as a nice four-stage linear cycle, but, uh, but often it is. Okay, planning. Um, the planning phase incorporates three stages, um, identifying a gap, prioritizing the opportunities, and, um, and then finally finding and appraising resources that are going to be the way that you're going to learn, as we discussed last time. And, um, and in many respects, what, um, what we want is not learning for efficiency, as, as is shown on the bottom of these three arrows, but learning for adaptability. And, um, and in, in modeling and coaching people to plan their learning, what we want to do is have them doing it. Okay, so because uh, because they, we won't always have someone there to specify the objectives, and so part of um, self-regulated learning is recognizing the need to learn, and so that um, so the putting people in situations where they have to specify the need for learning, uh, a la problem-based learning, is a, is a great way of exercising and developing that muscle. 
Um, so let's start with, um, with uh, a person's ability to self-assess. So that um, so on this plot here, what um, what I've represented is um, is a line from that ex that seeks to explain something called the Dunning Kruger effect. And, um, and what they did, these are two investigators at Cornell who, who sought to better understand self-assessment. And, um, and they did a whole series of studies in a whole bunch of contexts that boiled down to this framework. And, um, and I'll, I'll go through it with you. So say you had a class with 100 people in it. And say those hundred people uh, differed on some skill that's sort of, that's important to your um, your domain, such that um, everybody would, could be ranked from one to a hundred. And so that uh, so on the x axis here, on the horizontal axis, you could rank them from being the the bottom person in the class all the way across to the top. And, um, and, and in such a class, you could split them into quartiles. And so this is the bottom quartile, the second quartile, the above average quartile, and then the best quartile, so across the bottom. And then, um, and then you gave them a test. When you gave them a test of that, uh, of the thing in question, of the skill in question, and you plotted their marks on the exam. So that, um, so that uh, in such a thought experiment, the best person would score 100 and the least best person would score 1 and everybody else would be somewhere between 1 and 100 ranked according to their skill. And if you plot that, you get this plot. You know, the bottom quartile is lower than the second quartile is lower than the third quartile and the top quartile wins sort of essentially by definition. So that's all pretty straightforward. And that's uh, familiar to anybody who's been in a class and been tested and the like. But what Dunning and Kruger did that was really fascinating was that they then went to each of the hundred persons and said, hey, what did you score on that test? And they had each person write down what they thought they'd scored. And this is before they knew what their mark was on the exam. And so that um, so they had a hundred points of data, and they drew another line on here. And the other line on here is what people thought they scored on the exam. So as a thought exercise, I'm going to stop for 15 seconds. You draw the line that Dunning and Kruger found. So it's an interesting question, right? And it's not automatic where you would draw that line in terms of that, but I'll show you what they found, which is that, um, that people have a funky relationship to truth in terms of when they, um, where, what they score. So let's go through this in a, in a little bit of detail because it, had, it has direct implications for you and I trying to figure out how good we are in our clinical, uh, in our clinical environment. And so, so what, what you might have thought was that they would, there would be a straight line that would be somehow re directly related to the line of what people scored. And, but what they found was that in the bottom quartile, the people there were the worst at self-assessing. So not only were they the worst at the, that came, it came along with an inability to, to figure out exactly how good they, they were at the thing. But notice that the line isn't, you know, kind of uh, haphazardly around where they actually scored. They overestimate their skill. And they overestimate their skill by a lot. And so that, um, so that uh, and in fact, the bottom quartile, the second quartile, and the third quartile all overestimate their skill relative to where they actually fall. And this seems to be some sort of ego protective way that you and I are wired in that in order to get out of bed in the morning and go learn some difficult thing, we need to protect ourselves emotionally from um, the, the size of the gap between how good we are at the thing and, um, and where, what, uh, what is actually going on. And so notice that the bottom quartile of people feel that they're, they're not as good as the second quartile who, are not, who feel that they're not as good as the third quartile and so on. 
It's just that the line is so shallow in that, um, and and differs really quite markedly from the actual skill on the thing. And so that um, so part part of the message here is that in order to self assess well, you need to be good at the thing that those two things go hand in hand. Uh, so the one can't be divorced from the other. So the so there's a, this ego protective um, gap, and a, and it appears that we need to learn the thing in order to self uh, self assess how good we are at the thing. And then notice the really interesting thing up at the top that the top quartile um, don't exactly match where they're at. In fact, they systematically underestimate their ability at the thing. And this is thought to be an adaptive um, stance in the sense that if I underestimate my abilities, then I will be awake to all the signals in the environment that say I could get better. So uh, as a noted cognitive psychologist, Pat Crosscarry calls this uh, feral vigilance for um, improvement. And, um, and so that these people um, who have this uh, adaptive uncertainty are, uh, are likely to be to carry those behaviors that we want in an adaptive expert so that they're always questioning, am I good enough or more so could I be better? So that, uh, so that's a, a good way of being. And so the so what I find is that this graphic is really, really helpful to me as an educator because it allows me to recognize that when somebody's starting out on their journey towards competence, that I as an educator have to supply the signals as to where they're at. And uh, but in a way that doesn't ruin them emotionally. And so that or we're wired in order to protect ourselves and so that uh, so that that's where supportive coaching is is an important thing and that self-assessment can be used um, to monitor progress towards um, the eventual skill and so that competence is not only getting a certain number on an exam but it's you being able to rationally um, describe the boundaries of your expertise in a way that then allows you to serve to help your patients well in the sense that can i do this thing for the patient or should it somebody else a better person to do so? So this, um, this paper, Why People Fail to Recognize Their Own Incompetence, is a really accessible description of the Dunning-Kruger effect written by them. And so I highly recommend um, an external assessment of how, how good you are at your thing is either positive or negative. So the world thinks you're good at it or the world thinks you're not. And then on the, on the horizontal axis is what we've labeled internal assessment, your own assessment of how good you are. Um, and again, on a positive or negative axis, you think you're good at it, you think you're not. And so let's explore these, these four quadrants. Now, it's pretty straightforward when your assessment aligns with the world. So that uh, so if I think I'm good at it and the world thinks I'm good at it, life's jolly and, and just great. So that uh, so you've got reinforcement of what you're good at and uh, just keep going. And um, and even when I don't think I'm good at a thing and the world thinks I'm not, that too is aligned. So that uh, it reinforces the way you know my own self-assessment. It requires action, and um, and the point is is to is get on with it. And um, and what's good about my it being ego syntonic is that I can self-initiate, and there are low barriers to, to getting to moving on. Where it gets interesting is off the diagonal. And this is where we have to invoke again metacognition to think about thinking, because this part is indeed. Um, you know, if I think I'm not good at the thing and the world thinks I am, well, so that gets into that imposter syndrome. And uh, you know, I put in the middle there adaptive bias, that's that little gentle uh, underestimation of my abilities in order to be awake to the signals. But it's important to be calibrated and to not be way off into, uh, into imposter land. And so, that, um, so that here, the um, you know, exploring the gap as to why I thought I was not good at it and the world uh, does can be informative and help you to calibrate. 
the um, the final quadrant is very interesting, and so that um, so you and I are not wired to live in this quadrant. In fact, the um, the natural thing is to avoid it uh, if at all you can. This is where the world thinks I'm not good at it, but I think I am. And so that uh, so that this this is hard because because it's the most threatening, but it's also hard because it's the most valuable. And the reason I say that's hard is that um, is that seeking out this this criticism, this negative criticism of my abilities is, um, is something that, uh, that is easily avoid, avoided, but, um, but it's the thing that, uh, that could result in the most improvement. So, um, so this really, really benefits from coaching. And sort of being in a situation where the coach can tell you that you're not good at the thing and, and hold you to account for getting better. And where I think this is important in terms of metacognition is that it's one thing to teach somebody by giving them feedback. It's, a, it's another thing to teach them to seek feedback. And so that the best clinician that you could graduate is a feedback-seeking machine. And that's that clinician who follows up all their patients. From the emergency department, the patients they admit two days later, they go to the war to find out if within hours of hitting the war, they had to go to the ICU because you underdiagnosed. Or within hours of hitting the floor, they were discharged because they were fine. And so, that, um, so, so collecting that feedback in order to calibrate yourself and in order to draw the lessons from your mistakes. From, uh, from your failures. And that takes a certain amount of gumption and a certain amount of, um, of self-awareness that can be inculcated and can be supportive through a feedback positive um, environment, but it ain't easy. And so that, uh, and a lot of our structures work against that. So that, uh, so again, in training our learners to be master adaptive learners, one important, important segment of that is this feedback seeking um, behavior and specifically how to seek out negatively aligned um, feedback. Um, another important part of assessing is to judge the learning failed. And so that, um, so that here's, a, here's a favorite quote from, uh, from Thomas Edison, I have not failed, I've just found 10,000 ways that won't work. And Edison's point, I think, in, in saying this is that in the 9,999 failures, there weren't failures in the, in the sense of Edison being left with nothing at the end of each of those. In fact, with each of those, he developed a deeper and deeper and deeper model of what um, electricity and illumination was about. And so that it was almost inevitable that the 10,000 or the 10,000 first group. And so it's the same thing with our learning is that we need to learn in a way that, that isn't always successful. We have to try things. We have to invest time in learning that ultimately doesn't pan out. An example for that is in, in my role as a pediatric emergency doctor, we, we explored using ultrasound to diagnose appendicitis. We put, as a field, we put a lot of work into that. We just found that it didn't work. And, um, and that's okay. We, we learned where the border was for how ultrasound could be used to diagnose abdominal pain conditions. And, uh, and we are better off as, as a group for having done that work and it's spun off to a lot of uh, a nice increase in skill. And so here's my two boys. And, um, and so that the two boys have a completely different um, take on failure. Michael, the one on the right, is an expert at failure. And so that when he sees a line drawn in sand between doing something uh, as to a limit or a rule or something like that, he goes up to it, inspects it, and steps on the other side, fails a few times, learns from the failure, and has the deep sense of where that line is. Luca on the left is a young perfectionist, and so that he sees a line or a rule, something like that, off. he leaves it off in the distance and he organizes his life around getting nowhere close to that line of failure, because for him, that 
uh, that is um, doing what Michael does and, and getting beat up by um, working away at this is is true. so that um, so he had he had asked in a different way. The two of them are great. You know, sort of love them both, and I love it. You know, sort of that they have separate ways of approaching that um, that that concept, and so that I think we can learn from that in the sense that all of us are wired differently in terms of the uh, our willingness to fail within our within our domains, and the and the thing is is to is to use that diversity to approach the clinical problems in the, in ways where we do benefit from constructive safe failure, which I keep emphasizing to Michael. And so this is a great paper by Meredith Young on the utility of failure. And so, um, so the paper is about research and how research should be oriented towards failure. But my claim is, is that that's true for education as well. And that learning from failures is some of the best learning and should be incorporated into our models for how to learn best. So um, so we've gone through the three cycles of the math or adaptive learn, planning, learning, and assessing. And I believe um, we've stressed the importance of uh, of self-assessment in, um, in developing a learning plan. We talked about how to learn, how difficult that can be, and importance of assessing how well we learn and what we're going to do with it. Now I'd just like to talk about this adjusting phase. And so, that, um, so this is unique to the Master Adaptive Learner model and is, um, and is particular to the, you know, different from a PDSA cycle in that what this Will says is that we, having learned, need to now go out into the world and use that learning. And so that, um, and how does the individual fit into the system, and how does the, how do I how do I change the system for the better with my learning? And so in the adjusting phase, the implications of applying your new learning in the clinical workspace to consider. And the learner must consider whether the change needed is it is just within me, learner, or at the system level. And does this need to be routinized, or is it, um, is it more on the innovation end of the adaptive expertise uh, spectrum? So that, uh, again, the goal here is adaptive expertise. It is to keep our systems getting better and better as we move forward. And that's what this adjusting phase seeks to do. And so the, the key conceptualization here is the Rogers innovation curve. And uh, many of you all know about that. It's, uh, it's a guiding principle in terms of technology adoption. And, you know, so people talk about in business world well, the bleeding edge and the early innovators, the people who, when the iPhone 42 comes out, we lined up out the door to buy it in order to have the latest, greatest machine, and they're willing to um, live with uh, the consequences of early technology that doesn't have the bugs. And the rest of us are, you know, kind of early adopters, majority, early, late majority, you know, sort of it takes us more time, but that's a more common approach to learning something. It's a more common approach to adopting new technology. And then, um, and then there's a group that just is cynical about new technologies and prefers the old way, the relatively conservative from that standpoint. And often they get described with negative terms like laggards. But, uh, but in fact, they have an important role to play in the sense that not all new technologies are great and we should ask cynical questions about many of the things that get forced towards us that are just fads so that don't have a lot of substance to them. And so, that, uh, so again, looking at it from a population standpoint, you know, in the same way as I think that my two sons together will approach things in a, in a better fashion uh, because they've got two approaches to use. Um, so do we as a collective um, approach new technologies better for having a diversity of opinions on how well that new technology could work. But um, with time, uh, these things get clear and with time we learn and so that with time for good technology or for a good thing to learn, even the laggards come through. So that, um, so, that, uh, so that this learning curve for adopting new technologies is, um, is the way organizations work. And so we as master adaptive learners who've gone through the first three parts of the cycle, 
will um, will want to use those use our learning to um, influence the organization, and so that when we're wherever we are on the innovator to laggard spectrum, um, we should have something to say in terms of the way it works for the system. And so, um, so here we've got um, on the left, the master adaptive learner model. In the middle, the plan, do, study, act um, conceptualization for quality improvement. And as I said, the, the similarities are intentional. And on the right is a model for the learning organization in which um, five different elements that are analogous to what we've been talking about add up to an organization that learns all the time. And, um, and so each of these models operates at, at an individual organization, um, national kind of level, and, um, and all of them are really about learning. And so that thinking about learning, again, you know, it's a theme is going to be an important part to adapting in the future. And um, how we do that is, um, is what we need to be intentional about. And so, uh, so again, it uh, comes back to this idea from adaptive expertise of sitting in the middle of balancing efficiency with innovation in response to the context and situating our learning in this um, central learning for adaptability. On the left in this table, I've got the planning, learning, assessing, and adjusting phases, and they talk about the process of doing each of those things. Um, planning generate questions, but you, the person, have to have a questioning attitude. And learning, you need to critically appraise, and that's somebody who knows how to learn and has the habit of learning. Um, in the assessing phase, we talked about the importance of self-assessment, and that's where being self-aware is important, but also uh, developing a feedback-seeking behavior and habit. And then this adjusting phase, the process is about incorporating your learning into the system. And what we want there is a person who's uh, systems aware, whether it's the microsystem or microsystem. They're, they're not thinking just of themselves, but how they fit in. This person is ready to innovate. And so here's the cycle. We've gone through it all from planning, learning, assessing to adjusting. And, um, and I hope you can see the way the two, where the various pieces um, interrelate. Um, as, as diagrammed in the, uh, in the model. And, uh, and again, it's all in service of a metacognitive approach to learning, but one that uh, situates learning as part of our identity as clinicians and as a key clinical skill and not something separated from who we are. So thanks for thanks for watching, and um, and we'll hopefully see you in part four, where we explore the um, the utility of educational theories for the practicing clinician. Take care. <laughs>